Okay, welcome back. So, in the previous module, we were talking about the cancer effect. Uh, so, here we will start with the non cancer effect. So, if you have, uh, as we talked about uh, in the earlier module as well, that when you talk about uh, any impact coming from any chemicals, you can have cancer impact. That is the most uh, predominant one which we get, uh, we get worried about a lot. But at the same time, there could be non-cancer effect too, because non-cancer effect also leads to the problem if uh, you may have a liver issues, uh, certain things uh, do impact liver, uh, nervous system problem, the whole issues of uh, lead that uh, if, you, if you go on a petrol pump, you see unleaded petrol or unleaded gasoline. That unleaded means what? There was a lead sometime in our petrol, but we have we do not use that lead anymore. The reason for that lead being not used in, 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 the, in the petrol or even in lead based paint, many of the buildings are painted with uh, the paint that we use, uh, those Asian paint and Dulux paint and all those different brands that you see. Many of those brands used to carry lead. Now, we are phasing out of the lead. We do not want being exposed to lead. Lead is considered very bad for our impact on the nervous system. And, uh, the small kits, uh, especially for the small kits, for the leaded gasoline, leaded petrol, the problem was that if you look at the exhaust pipe of any of these automobile, whether it is a two wheeler, four wheeler, uh, you, the exhaust pipe is at the bottom and that is at the level where the small kits will walk around. So, if you have the exhaust coming out of these uh, automobiles, say if your car and it goes into a very low level uh, on the road, that is where our two, two years old, three years old and four year olds, that is the level they are. So, they are taking all these uh, lead in their ex smoke coming into their body, especially when they are take, going, waiting for say a school bus and all that. So, and that impacts their nervous system. Later on, I will show you some slides uh, like how it impacts. It has been already documented by research and all that. And there are certain chemicals like cadmium, even uh, iron at a very high concentration, I, although we need iron. But iron at a very high concentration, at a concentration of more than say 4.2 milligrams per liter in our water or it may have an impact on kidney. So, there are things which impacts kidney as well. And there are things which impacts reproductive system. Uh, boron is one of them. Boron is uh, say that boron has an impact on the reproductive system. We do not and we use uh, this glass that we use. Uh, many of those glass has a borosilicate glass. Uh, borosilicate because it is a boron and a silica. So, if your glass is not of a good quality, the glass that you use for day in and day out for drinking your water or drinking the tea, if it leaches little bit of uh, boron that you were with your tea or uh, water, you are getting little bit of boron in your body and that actually has a negative impact on our reproductive organs. So, that is uh, again uh, uh, these days the newer one of the newer stuff that we hear about is those uh, uh, thalates. Thalates are coming from those plastic pipes, uh, plastic bottles. Uh, plastic bottles again, those uh, thinner bottles, thinner plastic bottles. Uh, it, it has a lot of, uh, it has thalates are there. So that's uh, BFA, bisphenol A. Those are other chemicals which has an impact. And there are some which has an impact on the development. So people, uh, people's development gets blocked because of. Uh, so these are non-cancer effect. These are, uh, they are not going to cause you cancer. But at the same time, this has an this has an important uh, imp impact. So, you, you, you your certain organs are getting impacted, your reproductive system may be getting impacted and also the development side of it. So, whether it is a or like a cancer carcinogens or a non carcinogen, how do we quantify toxicity? And part of it we talked about that yesterday as well uh, like a, uh, in the first module as well. Uh, in terms of uh, quantifying the toxicity, it is natural to quantify how toxic a chemical is. So, we can control the level of this pollutant. Why we, are, why we are interested? As I said very in the very beginning of this class, for anything that you learn, you need to always try to think about why it is important. Why we need to, why do we need to quantify toxicity? How we can always figure it out? We need to quantify toxicity, so that we can control the level of these pollutants entering the environment. So, if you know how bad that uh, chemical is, we can control, we can reduce the chemical, either we can reduce the chemical concentration if we can do that or the other ways we can, we can limit the exposure. Many places for many uh, work uh, place, especially where there are a lot of sound and other stuff, they do not have 8 hours work day. They have actually less number of, uh, they work for less number of hours because they do not want people to be exposed to all that sound around them for 8 hours per day because it is bad for them. 
So, coming back here in terms of the controlling the level of this pollutant entering the environment. So, the toxic effect is potency times exposure. Potency means how bad the chemical could be and the exposure is how long you are exposed to it. So, it is not just how toxic a chemical is, it is also how much of an organism is exposed to that chemical. So, both are important. If the chemical is highly toxic as I was telling you in the just previous module, even if the chemical is highly toxic, you walk into a room and you came out and, uh, but you had a very low level of exposure. So, if you look at this particular equation over here, even if the potency is too high, if the exposure is very low, the product will be low, product will be less. Say potency is medium, exposure is medium, the product will be high. So, if the potency is very low, but the exposure is very high, again the product will be high. So, it depends on, it is a product of potency and exposure that, that dictates what will be the toxic effect from that particular chemical. So, so then how do we do quantify the toxicity? We look at the data. When data regarding the toxic impact, we look at the data and the data has to come from somewhere. So, if you remember from your biology class, uh, even if the high school level, we have done some dissection of animals. So, we look at uh, how the different like frog and toad and sometimes even mice and rat and uh, as you go in a higher level classes, you even have guinea pigs, uh, rabbits, uh, sometime uh, even uh, in some places in the world, they have used monkeys because monkeys are very close to humans uh, in terms of their build. So, monkeys were used, uh, monkeys were fed arsenic for example, monkeys were fed certain chemicals and they looked at how, where this arsenic is ending up, whether in the liver or in the tissue, how much in the liver, how much in the tissue, so that you can try to find out what can potential impact it may have to the human body. So, when the data regarding the toxic impact are gathered from the laboratory studies or from epidemiological study, again epidemiological as I was trying to mention it earlier, it is the, it is the data which is coming from the exposure to human population. We have some data now in terms of arsenic exposure in Bangladesh, Taiwan, Vietnam, those places. So, that is the epidemiological data. So, that is your and the information is gathered and we taking the information, we look at the degree of the toxic impact at different level of exposure. Since uh, we cannot have different level of exposure kind of data being exposed to humans, so we rely on animal studies and from the animal studies, we extrapolate it to the humans. So, and then once you do the animal study, you come up with this graph. So, you have this uh, y x axis, which is the exposure and your y axis is the toxic impact. So, when you start uh, your exposure, when you start at the low concentration, you first three dots, so you do not, there is no impact. That is why here we do not see any impact. There is no toxic impact. After this level, the impact starts building up and when you increase the exposure, exposure again, it could be either you can increase the chemical concentration or increase the duration. Both will lead to a increase in exposure and then at the certain uh, level, it kind of uh, tapers off and again, it becomes uh, a flat. So, this is your what is known as the dose response curve. You, I showed you this curve earlier in one of the module. Uh, this is the dose, res dose response curve and this is how it is prepared. You feed your animal species in the lab at different concentration or you increase the duration of exposure. So, duration of uh, like exposure to that particular chemical and then you see that okay, up to a certain level, no impact. If I increase the exposure level further, I start seeing the impact. When I go to a certain level, certain concentration, a certain exposure level, after that it starts tapering off. So, this is your typical S curve for a dose response. So, and then the point where you do not up to this point is your no observe impact. So, this is your no observe impact level. So, this is a so different terminology used for that. This is your novel. Novel is the no observed adverse effect level. So, that is the novel, uh, no observe uh, adverse effect. Then we have a term called lowell. Lowell is at what concentration, at what exposure you start seeing the impact. So, this is your uh, lowest observed adverse effect level. So, at that concentration, we start seeing some impact coming out. And then we can look at EC50. EC50 is essentially we are trying to say that exposure at which effect occurs in 50 percent of the population. So, if you are running an experiment with 10 different 10 fish and uh, you see the impact in 5 fish 
at certain concentration or certain exposure level, that is your EC50. So, that is your effective concentration or effective uh, exposure at which effect occurs in 50 percent of the population. So, that is the EC50. And when you go up here, we are basically seeing a 100 percent impact, that is your complete impact. So, again x axis is the exposure, y axis is the impact, we start from no impact, then we start seeing increase and then we start seeing the flat and this particular curve is typical S curve shape as you can see, it is a S shape like a slightly stretched S and then this is called dose response curve, which is one of the very important concept in uh, toxicology as well as in the risk assessment. Now, this data came from a lab study. Now, if you look at the epidemiological data, say data coming from Bangladesh or part of West Bengal or part from Vietnam, Taiwan regarding a arsenic exposure, you do not have the luxury of getting the data at very low concentration up to very high observer level. What you get is basically whatever you can you find from their uh, like samples and what kind of samples we are talking about, blood samples maybe, urine sample for arsenic even we look at the hair sample, nail samples. So, if those uh, things are uh, calc those things are collected and they look at uh, what is the potential impact coming from them, then you come up with these two data points. Now, these two data points are giving us a very high level of impact already and at a certain level of exposure. Now, the thing is that what will happen if we have a lower exposure and we will come back to that graph and try to explain it. So, we can estimate the effect as a result of exposure, but what exposure is acceptable? So, it is for uh, for different for cancer and non-cancer effect, we handle it differently. For non-cancer, we basically get a protective exposure and one is one with no effect. So, wherever we, we do not want exposure where we see any effect coming showing up. So, it is a non-cancer effect uh, which is protective exposure in is one with no effect showing up. In cancer effect, here we as I was explaining you are in the earlier module, we take the acceptable risk of one in a million cancer. So, if you have a one person out of a million people, why we do that? Because uh, say if you want to go even further, say one in uh, from one in a million to say one in 10 million, so one in 100 millions, the cost of treatment goes up. Again, if you see the drinking water limits uh, or which is we are always like drinking water, we need water from day in from day throughout the day. So, when you are drinking the water, what the water is supposed to be meeting the drinking water standard and if you if you are not familiar with drinking water standard, you should get familiar with that and uh, I would encourage you to kind of read about it. So, drinking water standards are based on certain uh, ex ex like a acceptable uh, exposure level and that is exposure level for a carcinogen is 1 in a million. So, for, a, for example, in arsenic we went from 50 micrograms to 10 micrograms per liter. So, right now arsenic drinking water standard is 10 micrograms per liter. Ideally, we do not want any arsenic, is not it? We would like to have 0, but the problem is we cannot, there are couple of problems here. Number 1, we cannot measure 0. We cannot really say that this concentration is 0, because no instrument can give us that uh, like a sh with surety that it is not 0. Every instrument has a detection limit, which we will talk about uh, in one of the module later on uh, very soon, that det it will only go up to the detection limit. And when you go closer to the detection limit, the reliability of the machine goes down. So, we need to, uh, we need to be careful with that too. So, now since we have a good machines with the lower detection limit, we could go down from 50 micrograms to the 10 micrograms, but we cannot really have it as 0. Our goal will be to have 0, but we cannot measure 0. So, that is one problem. And the other is when you go for this uh, lower and lower drinking water standard, your cost of treatment goes up because it becomes very difficult, it gets difficult to treat water at a very low at very low contaminant concentration. You need some, some of the very advanced uh, uh, treatment techniques. So, when you go for advanced treatment techniques, it is costly. So, again any, any economy you look at, any company you look at, any uh, country you look at, any city you look at, everybody has tighter budget. So, although we may say that uh, we would like to have 0 arsenic, but first of all we cannot measure 0. So, even if you say we bring it down to the say if the detection limit is 3 micrograms per liter, even if you want to bring it down to 3 micrograms per liter, just to take it from 10 to 3, the cost will be very high and that may not be worth it because of uh, it is in terms of uh, we need we need money to do other things as well. So, that is why we have to stick with protective exposure 
of one at the acceptable risk of one in a million. So, that is what we are uh, working with that. For the non-cancer risk, uh, we use the term reference dose. Uh, reference dose typically expressed in milligram per kilogram per day, which is the milligram of chemical per kilogram of the body weight and exposure in a day. So, how we, how we do that? We take the lowell or novel numbers. If you remember from the uh, dose response uh, curve we just saw, we can take the novel and uh, lowell numbers and uh, we can use that uh, number which actually since it came from the animal studies, we need to extrapolate that. So, we use a series of uncertainty factors. So, multiplied by uh, several uh, uncertainty factors and then we take it from say mice to the human bodies. And, uh, so, these are because of unknown such as difference in species, exposure, duration and all that. So, we use uh, uh, RFDs which is the reference dose. Some examples of RFD for example, cadmium this is oral RFD is 5 times 10 to the power of minus 4 milligram per kilogram per day. That is through the water ingestion and from the food it is 1 times 10 to the power of minus 3 milligram per kilogram per day through the food. So, what does that mean? Uh, our water should be at should be have less than uh, whatever the water we consume it uh, assuming 2 liters of water we consume per day the amount of cadmium that goes into our body through 2 liters of water should not exceed this and whatever we eat per day it should not exceed this number. There is no inhalation RFD for uh, uh, cadmium and the reason for that is there is a, when you try to inhale the cadmium is not volatile in a normal normal environmental scenario. So, that is why you do not see uh, cadmium inhalation RFD. Had it been certain other chemicals especially organic chemicals which does volatilize there will be an inhalation RFD as well. So, for most of the chemicals most of the toxicants uh, these kind of data the RFD data is already been done uh, you can find those uh, uh, data out there. There are different uh, websites, uh, there are different databases. Uh, this particular source so you can go to epa.gov slash iris and they have the database uh, for most of the toxicants that we come across from day to day life where they have these uh, RFD numbers, inhalation, oral and others as well as uh, other values out there. So, that is uh, it is in terms of the cadmium uh, con concentration. Then in terms of uh, for uh, non for the non carcinogen it is uh, we we use it for the, the we use what is known as a slope factor for, for sorry for the non carcinogen we use the RFDs for carcinogen we use the slope factor. Slope factor is the again the unit of population affected per milligram per kilogram day. So, that is the fraction of population affected per milligram per kilogram. Arcentity factor again is applied over here and we will take some examples of that. Then how we extrapolate this soft slope factor? The question is uh, if you remember earlier well we had this uh, data where we had these uh, data points where we you had few data points. Now, this is what you get from the epidemiological study. Sometimes the lab study also shows you that the cancer is happening at a very high concentration level and, uh, and their exposure is up to this uh, level like 10 to the power of minus 4 excess cancer risk. Now, our acceptable is 10 to the power of minus 6 is not it is 1 in a million. So, but here we are uh, having a 10 to the power of minus 4. So, which is uh, more than a 1 in a million. So, that is where we see that impact showing up. Uh, now, this is the impact uh, what would is shown up as part of the people having cancer or uh, the imp So, how to extrapolate these values at the lower lower exposure level. One aspect could be that you can say that I will how will make it linear. There could be a linear extrapolation where things are uh, extrapolated linearly and then that is your uh, you make a best fit line and take it all the way to the x axis. And then uh, one is your uh, uh, this is a linear extrapolation. One aspect is where the chemical is more potent at lower concentration because we do not know. We do not know what will what is the chemical whether it is a more potent at lower concentration or less potent at lower concentration. If it is more potent at lower concentration we will follow this uh, top line over here. If you see this dotted line and matching with that that this means that at lower concentration the effect is more uh, it is uh, more potent uh, uh, or it could be if its effect is less at the lower concentration the dead line will go something like that. So, this is uh, the different way to look at in terms of the extrapolation of epidemiological data at the lower level to find out what is the safe level. Because what we are interested is in 1 million cancer risk. So, we want a, if we draw a straight line from here 
uh, we are looking at uh, this. If it's a linear, we are looking at the exposure level here. And if you if you say there is an imaginary line going through this, if it's a uh, more potent at lower, we are looking at the exposure level over here. And if it's a less potent, we are looking at the exposure level somewhere over here. So based on what assumption we make, the exposure level varies a lot. But if you make a you, the linear one comes comes out to be somewhere somewhat in between. So that's uh, that's how. So we have to decide, and this decision is made based on certain assumptions, certain statistics, and all that. So the how we assess the risk, uh, which we were talking about in the earlier uh, module, the first module uh, of this particular week, the toxicity. We take the toxicity information along with the duration and frequency, and then we find out how much risk it has in terms of the contaminated soil and also that can be used to set the protective limits. So here are some examples we are where the how the equations for drinking water standard. So what ultimately what we are interested in uh, with uh, all these toxicity information, what we want is we want to come up with a safe level in our water, in our air, in our soil. So this is one example of how those safe level is calculated. So if you have to calculate the drinking water standard for, uh, for a carcinogen, so we so here C is our drinking water standard and TR is the target cancer risk which is 1 in a million that is what typically we use. BW is the body weight, body weight in kilogram and uh, oral cancer slope factor milligram per kilogram per day that is our uh, slope factor that we take and then the average water consumption rate liters per day. So taking these uh, values into picture we can find out what will be the standards in terms of the milligrams per liter or micrograms per liter for drinking water. So you say if you are looking for a, a certain uh, particular chemical, you, you, will, you need to find out what is the oral cancer slow factor, that is the, that's the value you will get from those EPA IRIS websites and other sources. Other things body weight, if it is an adult you can take 65 to 70 kg, there is a standard of how, how much we take. Then unit, uh, this one that cancer risk is a 1 in a million. Uh, average water consumption rate is taken as around 2 liters per day. So that is you can plug in those numbers and you get that. So that is uh, for carcinogen. For non carcinogen we as used as I told you earlier we use reference dose. So we have this oral reference dose because the water will be taken orally. So we have the oral reference dose that comes in there. Then we have the body weight and the average water consumption. So once you multiply by this. This is your milligram per kilogram per day, you multiply it by kilogram. So this kilogram and this kilogram will go away. Then you have a liter per day. So this day and this day will go away and then you will end up with milligrams per liter. So that is your standard that you will see for milligrams per liter for a non carcinogen. So that is uh, that's, uh, where uh, how these equations are calculated. So that is what for uh, drinking water, say if you think about the soil. For soil what we take uh, clean soil standard is say if you for the carcinogen where you, where, you, where you are worried about the ingestion route only. Ingestion route means say if the small kids has a tendency to touch the surface of the soil and then they will take their hand in the mouth. So that is called hand to mouth activity. So in terms of the hand to mouth activity these uh, small, small kids you, we can calculate uh, because they have the lower uh, body weight. So we are becoming a more, more conservative there as well. So again concentration in milligrams per kilogram, so that will be your target cancer risk, again 1 in a million. Body weight, uh, which uh, we can take uh, for body weight either for adult or for the, for the small kids as the case may be. Then you have the oral cancer slow factor, this data you will get from the iris uh, website that epa.gov slash iris. Then you have your ingestion rate, which is uh, how much, uh, for example if they have a hand to mouth activity where they put their hand in the mouth. Uh, from after touching the surface of the soil. So at to say how much uh, soil is getting into the body. So that is very, very important in terms of calculating it uh, for the small kids we see a lot uh, of those happening over there. So that is our uh, how this concentration can be calculated in terms of the clean soil standard. So that is uh, is needed uh, for that. So that is uh, in terms of uh, uh, once you have all these information, you can go for what is uh, the risk assessment. Uh, in terms of the risk assessment, uh, there, were, there are four steps. We talked about uh, basics of risk assessment uh, in the previous module. Uh, then this uh, so far we have kind of given you an overview of, uh, 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 overview of the toxicology aspect, the toxicant aspect. 
Now, if you look at the risk assessment part of it, after having all these information, first of all, we need to find out what is what is hazard, the hazard identification. So, say if you are looking at a certain particular scenario, uh, what is at what uh, what is the hazard associated with that? What kind of chemicals present? What kind of hazard? Whether it uh, then dose response. I think I gave you already a good, ex, uh, we, I, I showed you a dose response in the previous module and then also a dose response how it is generated in this particular module. So, you should have a pretty, pretty good idea. So, we need to do the dose response evaluation for that particular chemical. Then the exposure assessment, how much exposure, like what, what kind of exposure, how long the exposure and that is important and then we have to characterize the risk, what kind of risk is coming up and then when we have done all that, when we have assessed the risk, we can manage the risk. Manage means either you reduce the level of exposure or you reduce the level of toxicant uh, in the in, in your process. So, whatever works because sometimes uh, something will work on the other time, the other, uh, the other options may be work. So, it is not a one size fit all solutions, but this is uh, we after we had after looking at this four. Uh, like four steps, we can manage the risk and that is where it is very, very important. And sometimes risk management also has a risk communication and risk uh, communication, especially if you are a company, uh, risk communication is very, very critical. Say if what happened with uh, our, uh, with the Nestle Maggie issue was it was more of a risk communication it, uh, uh, problem rather than a risk, uh, as, uh, like a risk from those particular products. Of course, there was a risk from that heavy metals found in there, but uh, heavy metals can be there in other products too. Uh, if you look at, uh, I, if you take some oh, like our soil, our food samples, you go to any of the mall or any of the uh, Kirana stores and take some food samples and send it to an independent lab. You will find lot of uh, elevated level of certain contaminants there in our food. The reason is the food is, it is not the food, it is the water and the soil. Our water is contaminated, our soil is getting contaminated, our water uh, it for most part is contaminated to certain extent and we have air pollution issues in many parts of the country. So, all these things add up to having these uh, things being toxic. So, that is why it is, it's was as I said the Nestle Maggie issue was more of a risk uh, management problem rather than a risk, uh, risk sorry risk uh, uh, communication problem rather than a risk assessment or risk management problem. So, risk assessment, it provides a qualitative and quantitative estimation of the likelihood of adverse effect that may result from exposure to a specific health hazard or from the absence of beneficial influences. So, that is how we look at qualitative as well as the quantitative estimation is done. Risk management is after you characterize the risk as uh, mentioned in uh, two slides back, you seek to control the exposure of toxic chemicals in the environment that leads to law and policy, that leads to uh, how much should be the exposure level, uh, the standards, how much uh, the OSHA or occupational health and safety issues. So, that is how it leads to those laws as well as the policy aspect of that. So, based on, uh, so this is how kind of uh, again uh, kind of trying to summarize your relationship between the toxicological parameters, risk assessment, the how the risk assessment should be done and also in terms of the risk communication. Risk communication is very, very important. Say if you are working in a particular uh, setting where any anywhere you work there will be some risk. Even driving to the place of, driving to your place of work has some risk involved. If you are using a two wheeler or a four wheeler and that is again there is a risk. So, and then the car seems to be much safer, but then car also has, there is a level of risk involved there as well. So, as long as in any setting that you have there will be some risk involved you need to identify the risk, you need to manage the risk and you need to communicate the risk very well to the, to your employees or to your, your stakeholders at first and of course, in today's world even to the entire, uh, entire uh, like a global community through either through press release and what that. So, with that we will try to uh, kind of conclude this particular module and then uh, in the next module, we will try to get into some of the examples of uh, some of the imp important chemicals, so which is uh, uh, being used into the environment, which is getting released into the environment and what are the issues associated with that. So, okay, so let us uh, uh, conclude this particular module. Thank you very much and again, I will see you in the next module. Okay, all the best.